Welcome to the talk show, Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields in academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Fashion designer Albert Lukonga is today's guest. Albert will talk about his latest designs and how he got his start in the fashion industry. Fashion designer Albert Lukonga, welcome to Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Mark. <laughs> of course, of course. Albert, I got to be honest, I never ask guests for gifts, but after this interview, I expect you to send me the jacket that uh, and the watch that you're wearing on the homepage of your website. That's all I want. We'll probably pop it on the screen, that red jacket, that watch. That's all I want. I want to look nice and fancy. No big deal. Fantastic. Yes. So, so the- I appreciate that. We'll give you the address later. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, this this shirt was designed by Bernie Martin, another fashion designer. So I love interviewing fashion designers. Nice. <laughs> so, so Albert, when did your dream of being a fashion designer actually begin? The dream, well, we started, my mother's always been in the fashion industry since I was born, right? So she uh, she taught fashion. She did the uh, alterations, she did all that stuff. So she actually was a professor back home in the Congo. Uh, but so fashion has always been around me uh, since I was born. But the actual dream of me getting into the fashion industry started when uh, we came to Lexington and I actually opened up my first place uh, in 2010. Uh, so that's when it actually actually began. And then I had to reroute and start. It was under a different brand. And then I had to come back and start over and uh, uh, rebuild again. Yes. All right. So it's great. It's great that it's uh, actually in the family. You know, yeah. I, to, I don't I'm not an expert in fashion. I think I mentioned to you earlier, I worked for a company for a year when I retired from teaching. My friend uh, works with Scabal, a company in Belgium. And I learned so much. And I love seeing that they had made to measure suits. They had fabric and just really beautiful things. And I have to say that when I see a lot of fashion on TV, just me, It's not anything that I think the average person could actually wear. It just looks very different to me. But the things that you design really look like an upper scale, beautiful outfit. So when I stare at people, I would say, that's really nice. Other times I say, it just likes only a model could wear it. But I just just love uh, what you design. It's so kind of man and woman of today, but fashion is not an easy industry. As I, I said, I had the pleasure of being with fashion designer Bernie Martin in Los Angeles when he supervised the fashion show for the Hollywood African Prestigious Awards, the HAPA Awards. I could not believe how much was going on at once. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess I was like everybody else, put this on and walk. I mean, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. Oh my goodness, what was going yeah. on backstage, it was crazy. I thought I multitask. I mean, it was he was ironing and t- pointing and primping and helping. So it's not easy. So what are the difficulties that you experienced both, both in the past in the fashion industry and now that you've grown more successful? No, I, I feel like uh, some of the things that we have our actual experience uh, is, you know, the fashion industry is changing, but it's evolving at the same time as well. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, like you, one thing you just mentioned was uh, the fashion was trying to, uh, the industry is trying to put something on the runway that people can actually, you know, everyday people cannot, re- like yourself, cannot relate to. But they are more focused on the brand awareness of their brand. So they actually have different product. I'm sure most of them do uh, to cater to the everyday individual. But with, as far as I go, is at Albert Couture, what we do is we wanted to create something that's timeless, uh, that's unique, but that's going to last you a little bit longer, but with the edge to it, right? With the uniqueness to it. So if you look at the shirt that you're wearing, we try to focus on things like fabrics, uh, which enhances the longevity of that, as well as uh, the fit as well. It's not something, we're not doing anything that hasn't been done before. We're just trying to uh, offer, uh, example, in this state of Kentucky, something unique right but then through an experience so uh we sell clothing through experience that's what we tell them uh so uh instead of you going online and shopping how can we have you come into our store and have that unique experience without feeling like you're actually at their uh in a boutique store or anything like that uh we didn't want you to perceive like uh we didn't want to be perceived as a boutique or anything like that so uh so what we did was uh in order for you to shop with us you make an appointment pay a hundred dollars 
Uh, and then you come in and if you don't purchase any, anything that you get to spend time with me for hundred bucks, I guess. And we have a bar in here. Uh, we have all you can think of uh, from champagne and cappuccinos and all that stuff. And then we can kind of just kind of dig in and get to understand who our clients are. Oh, I mean, a lot of boutiques don't really, uh, I mean, uh, fashion designers don't really do that because it's more of a transactional thing. Uh, you come in, hey, how many clients do we have today? How many customers do we have today? We actually focus on who are we actually to care into? How can we improve their lifestyle? And then how can we follow through, right? So, uh, so that's something that kind of set us unique, uh, set us apart from everybody else. Uh, and the way we were able to do that is just call uh, the biggest brands in the world. Uh, if you look at Brioni, example, we'll call Brioni, make an appointment and say, hey, uh, how, I, I'm in Lexington. I want to make an appointment with you. You guys are in New York. Uh, well, you have to make an appointment online and you have to come in here. So we are like, OK, fine. If we can go there, we have to reverse engineer that and have actually we go to our clients. We get to fly to New York and take care of our clients, fly to Dubai, fly to Mexico and, uh, and uh, in places like that, because these individuals don't have a lot of time. They do want a good product, but they also have to spend a little bit more money. Uh, so we actually uh, want to take good care of them. This is where you are now. And I know you're going to go much further, but I need to turn the clock back to where you were and where yeah. Albert Lukanga is really from. So what struggles did you have yeah. to overcome on your way to success in the fashion industry? Because I want to know the story behind the glory. I mean, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a political yeah. crisis that was not easy to survive. Just walk sure, us sure. through that if you can. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you know, um, this is back in, I think the war has been going on. Uh, well, the war kind of started way before that, but I mean, in the 80s. And But the war that I, I'm, about, I'm about to speak about was from, it's kind of started in Rwanda, directed towards Goma and kind of spilled into the Congo. I wasn't extremely affected, but my parents, as far as my dad's family side, they were not as safe, all right? So my father was connected to a kingship family there. Uh, when I mean, Variety of kingship family is not the same as England. Uh, so uh, just to give you an, an idea there, but uh, it was, well, he was well known and when the war started, so the way they would raise money was to probably, uh, they would use diamonds or coltan and sell them and trade for guns and weapons, or they would just have somebody like my father, example, uh, to find a guy, individual like that, who were well known and hold him captive for ransom, basically, and raise money. So uh, at that point, my father had to escape uh, and I'm the seventh of uh, the tenth. Uh, I'm the seventh in the family. Uh, I have two older sisters and four older brothers and three little brothers. So uh, total of ten. All right. So my dad had to move all of us uh, out of the Congo, but he left my older brothers and older sisters there. So there were five back left, and we escaped through Zambia. We went to Zimbabwe, and this is back in 1998, 1999, and then that's when I kind of got to see the or you know with the naked eye what exactly was happening in the country uh with you know going through borders and all these roadblocks and seeing people literally uh you know go through some very very serious things including losing their lives as well so i was very young at that time i was probably i was i, I just i just happened to attend seven right so uh and when we got to zimbabwe in arare in the, uh, that was the capital city uh, my parents were there before just kind of set up things, but they were homeless folks sometimes. You know, my mom was, uh, she met, uh, I don't know how she kind of happened to meet, uh, she met one of the ambassador, you know, uh, I think she was the representative of the ambassador of England. Uh, she wanted to make some stuff and then she met this lady, which is my mom. And she uh, said, hey, I heard you can make some clothes. Can you make me a gown for a gala? And she goes, yes, but I don't have a house. And she goes, okay, well, you guys, I'm going to give you guys a house. You guys bring your family back uh, to Zimbabwe and you guys can use this uh, this facility that's, you know, paid by the government of England. Uh, so anyway, so that's, all, that's the reason why my dad was able to come back and pick us up. Uh, we went to school there, but we had to report in a refugee camp. Uh, and uh, so I grew up in the refugee camp. I was a refugee. I came to the state as a refugee back in uh, 2008. Uh, so, but we were originally supposed to go to Australia, but I needed to, I needed blood, uh, excuse me, I needed blood, blood transfusion. Mm. And so in order for you to leave, uh, everybody got to take a medical exam. You got to pass it and then you got to, you can go. 
I happened to be the person that failed the exam. So we, my whole family missed the trip to go to Australia. And then they decided to, the physician decided to kind of call her office and vouch for us and uh, move us on the next list, if I may. Uh, and then that just happened to be the United States. That's how we happened to come to the, that just, that, that was the whole entire caveat of me coming to the United States and being in Kentucky. Yeah. I have to say that that's such an inspiring story, but you tell it as if I would be talking to a friend saying, pass the ketchup. I mean, <laughs> you say like, yeah, and then this and a blood transfusion and I failed it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. so, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, aren't successful in business. Uh, businesses, uh, many, a large percentage fail. And there's a lot of adversity, a lot of obstacles and struggles. But to me, I think that you, as a young person, overcame such obstacles that this is almost like a challenge to you that that you know you're up for any challenge but sure. uh, when, when we talk about you being meant to be in fashion uh, i believe you were known in high school as not just the best dressed student you were the best dressed soccer player yes that's right that's a real <laughs> category best dressed math guy best dressed yeah. uh, wrestler <laughs> so i know that you were involved with some what we call the soccer moms and there yes. were some soccer moms that i think you describe as being game changers and life changers for you. So could you tell me uh, about the soccer moms who changed your life? Yeah, uh, when we came to Lexington, uh, this is 2006, uh, uh, mid-July, and uh, we uh, we were in Lexington. Uh, there was it's very hard to find any other African uh, family around here. So we were very, we were very, we were in a unique place, right? But uh, uh I think it's about a week or so after prepping up for school, uh, we had this lady that showed up at the house uh, and uh, her name was Pitney Jones and she was a financial advisor at Wells Fargo. She said, she said hey, I heard you guys are here from Africa. Um, my name is Pitney Jones. I'm going to I would like to help. You know, uh, what do you guys need? And I, I have actually when I met her, she mentioned to me, she goes, I had I just actually a uh, couple months prior to me arriving, she had to bury her son, who was my age. Uh, so anyways, uh, so I happened to be that son. Uh, and then uh, she was like, well, you should come over to the house. I can help you out. I'm going to help you out. Homework and do all that and figure out things and get you set up for school. So I started going over to the house. And before I knew it, uh, you know, I was having lasagna. I was very <laughs> You know, I was li living that American lifestyle, you know, uh, learning how to sit on the table properly and eat properly and, uh, and go to West Virginia for uh, to ski and uh, in South Carolina every summer to surf and all that. So I was living that life already. And uh, until my senior year of high school, uh, when uh, I was prior to a couple of days prior to graduate, uh, graduating, uh, she passed with breast okay. cancer. So I was very devastated by that. Uh, and um, I just, you know, whatever scholarship that I had of school, whatever plans in endeavor that I had planned after graduation, I just kind of threw it out the window. And I just wanted to just relax and do nothing and just kind of, you know, life did not matter at that point. And until I, until I got it, almost got in a car wreck at one, at one point, uh, I was driving after, you know, drinking with a couple of friends. And I was driving along and it was raining and then the car started sliding and there was a truck, semi truck behind me that was about to just demolish the car in half. So it completely kind of like life flashed in front of your eyes, basically, and had to rethink my life and think about what I wanted to do. So uh, and it's always been the saying has always been, hey, Albert, you should definitely think about starting a st store and building something here because, you know, you always stay and we need this. And, uh, we don't. and I was like, at that point, I was in college. I was doing bio pre -made, trying to I was at the University of Kentucky and I was trying to basically become a cardiologist. And uh, when I started shadowing physician, I just didn't like the lifestyle. And it was, you know, it was the, also the most expensive career in the, in the medical field. Mm. So uh, I just, my parents couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford it. So I just happened to settle on what I knew best, which is fashion. Uh, so uh, so fashion is not, hasn't always, if you can tell my story, it hasn't been like, well, since I was a kid, I've always dreamed about becoming fashion designer. I did not even know what the word fashion designer even meant, right? But I always had dreams about dressing well, watching movies like James Bond, you know and picturing that and like wow, wow like i can actually dress these people i can actually look like this you know but i did not know what the word fashion designer ever meant i did not know what the fashion industry did i just knew what my mom did right Ooh. so 
so that's that was my experience with soccer mom but they've changed my life for completely i learned english faster than any other african kid around here you know i was very very ad- adapted to the environment really quickly and that kind of gave me an edge and uh, to uh, to focus on what i wanted to do wow what a story what a metamorphosis because all i'm hearing is you know you're starting the conga and now you're eating lasagna yeah and, that's- <laughs> and, and you're learning all these things and that your english is, is really outstanding and you really found your calling and a lot of people can't find their calling and when they do they can't always answer that calling so i just, yeah. just moving forward moving forward so now let's talk about kind of where we are today where do you get yeah. the ideas uh for some of your designs so most of my ideas come from movies. Uh, I'd like to travel a lot. Uh, and uh, so like, if you look at my fashion show, the first fashion show was the Castle Fashion Show, which was done at the castle, at the Kentucky Castle. And I kind of have, you know, pieces that kind of resembled uh, what would you wear if you're, you know, invited to a castle, right? And, and so, and then my last previous fashion show was one in Monaco. And I wanted to bring Monaco to Lexington, Kentucky, which is, People were like, well, when I started the show and I kind of marketed it, people thought the show was going to be in Monaco, in Monte Carlo. But they were, I said, like, no, it's in Lexington. So we had a house here and every single, every piece in collection uh, that I made in that in that show was based on what would you wear when you in Monaco, cocktail, yacht, collect, and all that, right? So the new collection that I'm designing right now, it's called uh, the Yacht Collection, which the fashion show is going to be on the yacht in Miami. So this is going to be the very first fashion show in October or the 25th and the 26th. But uh, it's the inspiration comes from mostly, you know, sometimes I could, you know, uh, I like to people watch a lot, uh, you know, uh, watching movies that are a little bit more, the 80s movies, uh, whether in, you know, in, you know, in the Middle East, uh, in, in, in America, uh, and just understanding what the story actually meant. Uh, and, um, and the other stuff is just reading books and understanding people's uh, bio- uh, biographies and where they come from, the lifestyle, and and I could dress them based on everything that kind of they went through their life, right? They're physician and they're married, they have kids. I could picture that lifestyle and put myself in that position and see how I could make each and every single piece for uh, the, the everyday lifestyle. So I don't know exactly how I do it. Uh, sometimes people tell me so I can I teleport out of my body, I guess, I don't know, whatever. But it's just um, I just do it, and it's a nonstop thing. It's it's a button that I can never turn off. Uh, sometimes it can be very very annoying, uh, and or bugging. So I, I, tend, I tend to avoid parties like wedding parties. Um, and uh, when I was shopping with, I start fixing people's ties and people's stuff, and just kind of like fixing them up. So uh, it's a little scary, but uh, I think uh, that's a issue that I have. Yeah, we only so. have a couple minutes left, so I want to ask you: What would your advice be to young people? It's not an easy industry. There's a lot of competition out there, but somebody has the passion, the talent. What uh, advice would you give to young people who are interested in doing something in the fashion industry? Sure. Uh, well, you know, there was a one point where passion was a thing. You know, you tell your kid, you need to find a passion. You need to find your passion. You need to follow through, and da 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 think today it's a little bit easier to for a lot of people to have passion uh, a lot of people think about their life and are trying to execute on that but uh with technology and so many things and so much information things are a little bit easier to do with ai so i think now it's you have to find an addiction you have to find something that you love so much that you can never turn off that nothing would stop you and you're willing to give everything and anything to make that happen uh, I am the perfect example of that going from not having money to spending time in Europe, three, three years in Europe, driving around, traveling around with my own pocket money from working three jobs, trying to understand how these products are made, how shoes are made, how sunglasses are made and learning and educating myself. And then coming back home and walking around and driving around town and with all these fabrics behind the tr- trunk of my car and popping them up and selling them uh, with the same price that I sell them today, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just having that confidence and having to understand that you need to know your product in and out. You need to know your company in and out and you need to understand your client in and out uh, and be so addicted to it that you stand out and don't focus on competition at all. Uh, just focus on what you can do best for your clientele. And that's what I do here. And uh, the other thing is also 
um, have a bigger motivation than just working up in, I can't wait to become famous or make a lot of money. Uh, my motivation is usually death, right? So like when it's lights out, it's lights out and how are people are going to remember you and all that. I think everybody should have that as a motivation at some point, right? To realize, to think about their lives, to think about what they've done, what they've contributed to the, uh, uh, what they have co contributed to this world uh, since they were here. It doesn't matter if you come from, uh, you came as a refugee or you uh, come from a, a wealthy family, um, there's going to be a point where uh, people are going to need your service. And uh, we are in the service of taking care of people. We don't sell clothes. Uh, we sell experiences and we sell confidence and we sell that. That's what I understand that we, we do here. Uh, and since then, we completely changed my life. Yeah. That's, it. That's such great advice for the viewers because I'm hearing passion, purpose, and perseverance. The three Ps, I would say. So yeah. uh, I just, that's incredible. And I just have to say uh, to the viewers, getting great advice today. Don't forget to watch us on E360 TV, available on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. EST, available on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. Remember to follow us on social media. Life Stories with Mark Hoberman is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and of course, our YouTube channel. So subscribe. Fashion designer Albert Lukanga, thank you so much for your openness and your transparency on how you got to where you are today. Thanks so much for being with us. Ah, oh, Thank you, Mark Hoberman. I appreciate you. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at lifestorieswithmarkhoberman.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman.